Today on the John Ankerberg Show, who really was the baby in the manger that is celebrated at Christmas? My guest today is former atheist turned Christian, Lee Strobel. He received his Master of Studies in Law degree from Yale University, and then became the award-winning legal editor of the Chicago Tribune for 14 years. As an atheist, Lee liked the Christmas parties and presents, but did not believe the baby in the manger was the divine Son of God. But one day, he decided to investigate the evidence for himself. Consulting experts on the Bible, archaeology, and messianic prophecy, Lee wanted to know who was the baby in the manger. He thought if Jesus really was God in the flesh, then there ought to be credible evidence, including can the biographies of Jesus be trusted? What does archaeology reveal? Did Jesus fulfill the attributes of God? Did Jesus uniquely match the identity of the Messiah predicted in the Jewish scriptures? After investigating the historical evidence for two years, what did Lee discover? To find out, join us for this edition of The John Ackerberg Show. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg. I've got a question for you today. Do you believe that the historical events of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ at Christmas was a real historical event? Or do you think it's just a fairy tale? You enjoy Christmas, I'm sure. I don't care what part of the world that you're living in, you're listening to us right now. When we get to Christmas, you got the lights, the presents, and so on. Do you really believe that this happened? Because it has major implications if you believe that the baby in the manger, Jesus, was really the incarnation of the God-man, all right? We're going to talk about that today, and my guest today is Lee Strobel. He was a staunch atheist and grew up right around where I lived uh, when I was young, and he became the legal editor of the Chicago Tribune because he went to law school and got his degrees and uh, went into journalism, got his degrees there. So he was an expert at this and he uh, checked out trials and uh, covered some of the massive stories and actually uncovered a lot of things that hit the news all over this country. All right. And Lee, I'm really glad that you're here today. Thank you. But we want to talk about this thing. One time uh, you've been on Larry King, I've been on Larry King and you were uh, listening, and Larry King made some interesting comments about Jesus. And it had to do with the baby in the manger. Who was he? And so someone asked Larry <laughs> King if he was doing a show and he could choose any guest in history to be a guest on his TV show that day, okay, who would he ask? And what was his quick response? He said, Jesus Christ. Yeah. And the person, why? Yeah. And his answer was, I would ask him if he really was virgin born. Because he said, if he was, that would change history for me. Yeah. And people don't realize that folks that they see on television like this, sometimes we get the chance to talk to them through interviews and so on. When you talk to them backstage, they really mean it. Yeah. Okay? And it's just that they haven't had the chance to talk about the very things that we're talking to today that you can listen to, all right? Let's talk about this thing. Why was the virgin birth so important? Was Larry King correct? Yes, in many ways. I mean, it would define history if Jesus was indeed virgin born. Why? Of course, the resurrection, we have a lot more historical data for. We have the empty tomb, we have early accounts, we have eyewitness testimony and so forth. Now. How do we know someone was really virgin born? Right. I mean, that's a little harder to determine. Right. And so we have to look at what is the reliability of the record that we have. Does it show itself to be reliable when it is tested? And if it does time after time after time after time after time, then perhaps we can trust it when it talks about the way that Jesus was conceived. Yeah, does it make sense theologically, scientifically? Is it consistent with reality? Right. Does the person that is virgin born, the baby in the manger, does he turn out to be somebody special that's unique from everybody else? Right. If he does, then you can say it happened. Exactly. And there was a poll taken that yeah. blew my mind. I don't know if it blew your mind, but the fact is, is that tell the folks about the poll 
when they were asked, uh, how many of you believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ? Yeah, 79% of Americans say they believe in the virgin birth. It blew my mind too. I mean, seriously? And here's my answer to that. Wow, if you really believe in the virgin birth, that should change your life because it means Jesus is who He claimed to be, the one and only Son of God. It should change everything, and yet we clearly don't have a country in which 79% of people are fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So there's a disconnect there. They may believe in the virgin birth, but I don't think they're thinking through the implications. Yeah. What does it mean for the baby to be born of a virgin? Mm. Give a theological definition of this. It's important for two reasons. First of all, a foundational belief of Christianity is that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And so you had to have the human influence in His birth through Mary, and you had to have the divine influence through the work of the Holy Spirit uh, in order to yield Him as being fully God and fully man. Um, and that's important theologically, but it's important as well practically, because it means on a human level, uh, he can relate to us. As Hebrews says, we have a high priest who himself has suffered and has walked in our shoes, so to speak, has lived in our world, and consequently he did it without sin, but he also lived in our world that we're living in. So he can relate to us in a first person way. That's important. And then the divine part is important because we're not left alone in this. He came into this world as um, the second person, the Trinity, and he lived the perfect life, which none of us have been able to do, and he went to the cross and paid the penalty we deserve for the sins we've committed and offers forgiveness and eternal life as a free gift of his grace. Yeah. Now, the Bible says all have sinned and yes. come short of the glory of God. And you just said something that Jesus was born without sin. Right. And I want to take two verses. One is starting with Matthew. 118. How in the world, if all the rest of us are born as sinners, how could Jesus be born without sin? Yes. Okay? His mother Mary, according to Matthew, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, Matthew says, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And what's interesting, John, is the version that also describes this in the book of uh, Luke. Right. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And consequently it says, He was born holy. He is the Son of God. Well, there's a connection here. We, we may not understand it all, but what the Bible is saying is there's a connection between the fact that we are all born with original sin, which means uh, we have a corrupt nature that has been imparted to us through the generations because of Adam's first sin. Um, and yet that was interrupted by the power of the Holy Spirit causing Mary to get pregnant. And so somehow that line of original sin is severed in the case of Jesus, and He is born um, holy. He is born without sin, uh, which is uh, critically important because God cannot sin, and uh, He lived the perfect life and was the perfect sacrifice to pay for the sins that you and me and all of our viewers uh, have committed. Yeah, Luke says this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Yeah. And I also think that uh, Protestants give too little credit to this little virgin woman yeah. who hears the angel giving her this message yeah. and thinking all the thoughts that you would normally think, what does this mean? Yeah. What's going to happen to me? How is this going to happen to me? In fact, she asked, how am I going to become pregnant when I don't even know a man? Yeah. And she was engaged in the Jewish way in the sense, but she hadn't had sex with him yet. In fact, when Joseph found out, he was ready to divorce her, put her away. Right. And the angel had to tip off Joseph, no, this is of God. Now, why was it important that Jesus be born without sin? Well, he had to be the perfect sacrifice. He was God. He was God. God cannot sin by definition. And um, he was the perfect sacrifice to pay the penalty that we all deserved uh, so that we could be set free, reconciled with God, and spend eternity with him in heaven.
Yeah, a little sideline here. Many Catholics believe that the reason Mary didn't impart original sin to Jesus was because she herself was immaculately conceived in her right. mother's womb, and so she was without original sin. So she was the cause of it. Yeah. That's not, first of all, what the Bible says. That's right. It was the Holy Spirit that did it. Give me some other reasons. It's interesting you bring up immaculate conception because people hear that and they think that refers to the virgin birth of Jesus. It doesn't. It refers to the supposed uh, sinlessness uh, of, Mary. of Mary and her conception. But um, there is no biblical reference that supports that, first of all. Yeah. Uh, second of all, how could that be true? It would have to mean her mother was immaculately conceived and her mother was, and it would just go back just philosophically and practically it doesn't work. And the fact that it wasn't really codified until Pope Pius IX uh, in 1854. the year uh, 1854. So yeah, he put it in at that spot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I think, you know, you hit on something else, though, that I think is so important. Um, I think Protestants tend to go the other way and kind of downplay Mary. And yet, my goodness, of all human beings who've ever lived, he chose Mary. Uh, to be the, the vehicle through which uh, Jesus would come into this world. What an incredible privilege. What, a, what does that say about her? Um, I think she deserves a lot more admiration than Absolutely. I think sometimes uh, we Protestants give her. Yet in her prayer she said, you know, God my Savior. The yes. fact that she realized she was a sinner herself and she needed her son basically to save her from her sin. And exactly. he did that when he died on the cross. Now. Uh, let's back up here for a minute for skeptics, yeah. okay? You are one of the staunchest skeptics mm -hmm. we had in Chicago. Story after story <laughs> that you just didn't believe anything, okay? And the fact is, how in the world did you come to the conclusion that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were actually historical bios that uh, the historians had to use historical tools to investigate. When yep. you investigated and you used those tools, it led you to a conclusion that you didn't want to come to. Right. Right, exactly. I mean, looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, which are classified, by the way, by historians as ancient biographies, right. not mythology, right. but biographies, which are intended to report on what actually occurred. Um, I looked at, uh, can they be trusted? A and I put them to the test. And one of the tests is, how immediately did they come about after the events they describe? Was there a long period of time during which legend developed? Because A. N. Sherwin White, the great classical historian from right. Oxford, said the passage of two generations of time is not even enough for legend to grow up and wipe out a solid core of historical truth. So we want documents that uh, are eyewitness based and that come close to the events. Well, we can date, you know, Luke talks about the virgin birth. We can date that gospel. How? Because we know that Luke wrote the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Um, uh, the book of Acts ends with Paul being imprisoned under house arrest. Um, it doesn't report the martyrdoms of Peter or James or the war that broke out in AD 66 or the destruction of the temple in AD 70. Why not? Because it was apparently written before those things took place. So that means we can date the book of Acts to about 60 to 62 AD. So therefore the gospel he wrote, the first part, must come before that. And so that is even earlier. We know that he also used Mark as one of his sources. So now that goes back even earlier. And um, we also have creeds and, and hymns of the early church that go back even earlier. Keep in mind that Jesus was put to death in 30 or 33 AD. So this is the first generation. And, and, and therefore, historically speaking, this would be when you have perhaps the most accurate information that didn't get tainted by this long-term legendary development. Uh, so you look at things like that and you say, is Luke corroborated where it can be corroborated by archaeology and other sources? You bet. Yeah, repeatedly. Over and over. Over and over. He's one of the greatest historians who ever lived, right. uh, according to A.N. Sherwin White. Right. Um, and so you look at things like um, uh, the archaeology, the other sources. You look at the way it was transmitted through history. Can we trust the transmission? Yes. No cardinal teaching of the church is in any jeopardy from any variance between the various manuscripts we have. We have more manuscript evidence for the uh, New Testament than, than any anybody. other ancient yep. document by a huge factor. So I looked at all this stuff and I said, yes, it is extraordinary what it reports, uh, the Gospel of Luke and the other Gospels, but they pass the tests of history. Now, one of the big hang-ups that a lot of people have, including me and our friend William Lane Craig, right. uh, was that, well, wait a minute, 
uh, Mary didn't have the Y chromosome, right, so they, she couldn't have a male child. Right, women have two X's and a guy has a Y and an X, and so you have to have, to have the guy bring that Y over, and yeah. she, if she's virgin born, you're saying, where did that Y come from? And so our old buddy here, William Lane Craig says, I, I don't understand how this could happen. That's right, he, I remember talking to him, he said, that was a big hang up for me to become a Christian. And I said, well, how did you resolve it? And he said, well, and of course he developed the famous Kalam cosmological argument for the existence of God, which says, whatever begins to exist has a cause. We now know the universe began to exist, therefore the universe must have a cause behind it. What kind of a cause can bring a universe into existence? Must be powerful, given the immensity of the creation event. Must be smart, given the precision of the creation event. Must be immaterial or spirit, because it existed before the material world. Must be timeless or eternal, because it existed before physical time was created. Must be caring, because he created a wonderful habitat for us to exist in. Must be personal, because he had to make the decision to create. And Occam's razor, the scientific principle, would say there would be just one cause. So what have we got? You, you go down the list and say, wait a minute, this is a description of the God of the Bible. And so William Lane Craig said, well, that means Genesis 1-1 is true when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then he said, in his great logic as a, a great philosopher, he said, if God can create a universe, then creating a Y chromosome in Mary would be child's play. Yep, absolutely. And, yeah. If Jesus um, was supernaturally born, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, paid for our sins. But people that are listening right now mm -hmm. believe what we've said so far, but they themselves have never moved on it. They've yeah. never made a decision for them to personally get involved. There may yeah. be a lot of Christians that have gone to church all their life and they thought just because I've gone to church and I believe this stuff intellectually, yeah. the fact is I'm going to heaven, Yeah. okay? And I would warn them, Jesus said, you know, there's two ways. You got a broad way and there's a whole bunch of people on it. And there's a narrow way and there's only a few that are on it. And I think there's a lot of people, I'm gonna say this carefully, there's a lot of people that go to church and yet, they believe all this stuff with their mind, but they have never given themselves over to yeah. the Lord Jesus. They, put, they never put their trust into what Jesus did for them and asked Jesus to apply it to their life, to forgive their sins, to put the Holy Spirit of God into their life so that they can actually change. The Holy Spirit gives you the power. You don't have the power to change, right. but if you ask Christ, He comes into your life through the Holy Spirit, and the fact is then He says, I'm gonna take you to heaven someday, and they're not going to heaven because they haven't done that. Yeah. And I'd like to spend the last few minutes talking in this program to those people all over the world, because this program goes all over the world, I wanna know, what would you say to them that they could experience this personally? Yeah. And folks, I've seen this happen all over the world, and when people invite Christ into their life, they just can't believe what Christ yeah. can do in their life. Yeah, John, I remember the moment when I realized this is true, November the 8th of 1981, after this two-year investigation, this is true, and I didn't know what to do until I read John 1, 12, but as many as received him, Yep. To them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And I realized that's the equation of faith. Believe plus receive equals become. And when I received this free gift of God's grace, I became a child of God and my values and character and morality and attitudes and relationships and priorities all changed over time for the good. So if people say, you know, golly, um, as best I can, I do believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be. The 79% who say, uh, yes, I believe he was virgin born. Right. If those that look at the evidence for the resurrection say, yes, it's true, he returned from the dead and proved his divinity. If you wanna take that step and not just believe it, but receive it, then you just pray a simple prayer, just like I did on November the 8th of 1981. Say what I said. I said, Lord Jesus, as best I can, I do believe that you are the Son of God. And I confess the obvious, I'm a sinner. No question about that. But I wanna turn from that. And I wanna receive your free gift of forgiveness and eternal life that you purchased on the cross when you died as my substitute to pay for all of my sin. Thank you for enduring the torture of the cross 
so that we could be reconciled forever. Help me to live the kind of life that you want me to live. Because from this moment on, I am yours. If you pray that prayer out of a sincere heart, you have become a child of God. And you know what, John, the first verse I memorized as a new believer said, these things are written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that in order that you may know, know yeah. you have eternal life. God doesn't want you in a state of anxiety or confusion about where you stand with Him. You can know for a fact. And if you pray that prayer with sincerity, you can know for a fact that you have been adopted as God's son, his daughter, forever, and you will spend eternity with them. Yep. You know, Lee, there's a lot of kids out there that want to go to a school where they've got professors like yourself mm. and the ones that we've been talking about that actually talk to non-Christians and can give the answers that non-Christians want to hear and don't hear from anybody else. Yeah. And you've become the president of a school, I'd like you to say a word before we close this program sure. and tell them what you're trying to accomplish and how they can get in on it. We'd like to help people understand how they can better share and defend uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. Uh, apologetics, giving reasons and answers. What you've done, John, and what you've pioneered through many, many years. Uh, so we want to train people to do that. And so we have gathered together 40 PhDs. We've created over 90 courses. Uh, uh, you can get your bachelor's degree, your master's degree, all accredited and all online. Uh, or you can just take courses on the certificate level just to grow. If you want to take a course on the resurrection, for instance, or on world religions, or on evangelism, or how churches can be more effective, or whatever. We have all these courses that are available. And uh, if you go to strobelcenter.com, all the information is there. You can talk What's to a counselor. What's the name of the school? It's Colorado Christian University is the university. The center is called the Lee Strobel Center for Evangelism and Applied Apologetics. We use that term applied apologetics because we want people who don't want to become ivory tower academics, but people like you, people who use it, people who share it over the back fence with a neighbor or who do a blog, who do a podcast, or who put it into action to help reach a world that is spiritually confused. Folks, I don't think I've ever given this kind of approval to anybody else. I've known Strobel for all these years, and I'm simply saying he's the real deal. He's got some of the best books, The Case for Miracles, The Case for the Creator, The Case for all kinds of things. And yet, the fact is there's nothing like hearing him in person. But there's other guys that we've had on the program and that we know together that are teaching at his school. All right? And I'm saying, look it up, call them, find out the information, and I'd say, this is a good bet if you want to get a solid education. And those of you that are parents, you want your kids to go where they can go to get a good education. So take it from me, I would recommend this highly. Now folks, thanks for joining us today, and I want you to stay tuned because I got one personal word for you in just a moment. Stay tuned, John will be right back. So why was Jesus born? Why did God come into the world like this? Jesus said he came to seek and to save those who are lost. He says it was because God so loved the world, he loved you so much that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You see, Jesus came into the world to pay for your sins. He died on the cross and then he rose again so that you can be completely forgiven and spend eternity with him. This isn't something that you can earn through your own good works. He offers it to you as a free gift which you can receive through putting your faith in him. If you would like to do this right now by asking Jesus to be your savior, I invite you to join me in this simple prayer. Just say, dear God, Thank you for loving me. I know I am a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness right now. I believe that Jesus is your son and that he died for all my sins on the cross. I also believe that you raised him from the dead. And right now, 
I want to trust him as my savior and follow him as my Lord from this day forward. Please give me the strength to live for you. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You know, folks, one day I said a prayer just like that. And if you prayed this today, I want you to know what God promises to do for you. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, that's you, if you just prayed this prayer, and if you did, I want you to see what God says he will do. He says, shall be saved. That's what God does. He promises to save you. Now, if you'd like to watch this program again or share it with a friend, you can do so for free on your phone through our app. Just go to the app store on your device and search for Anchor Bird. Once you download it, you can watch this series again, as well as over a hundred other programs, anytime, anywhere, absolutely free. To find these videos in your language, simply open up our app and tap on Languages. Along with this, our app lets you read and even listen to the Bible in over a thousand languages. Simply tap on the Bible icon displayed on the main page of our app to find your own language. Once it opens, you can find your language by tapping on the second box at the top. If you have never read or listened to the Bible, I encourage you to find your language and check it out for yourself. Next week on The John Ankerberg Show. The Old Testament contains prophecies or predictions about the coming of the Messiah, the King of Israel in the world. Yeah. It's almost as if these prophecies form like a fingerprint or a thumbprint. Yep. Whoever fits that thumbprint, that will be the Messiah. And only one person in all of history has done it. What's more, we have to look at these predictions of Isaiah in context. Uh, there is a complex of messianic prophecies and descriptions that are used. In Isaiah chapter seven, it's about the coming of the Messiah. In Isaiah chapter nine, he is already there and he is called mighty God and he is ruler. And then in Isaiah 11, he is ruling and reigning. And so this tells us that this is a predictive prophecy. And as one mathematical analysis showed, the chance of any one yeah. individual fulfilling just 48, we'll give you more than 48, of these ancient prophecies. Let me give you be, the number. I'll go for it. One chance of a trillion, 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 trillion. That's it. That's equivalent to one atom in the entire universe. Right. 